So I think we'll have to start so that we can uh, make sure to keep to time. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, so in this session, we're gonna have three papers that are gonna look at the impacts of reforms on how mental health can be handled outside of mental health institutions and uh, primarily how they impact deaths of despair as well as crime. And uh, these papers fit together rather nicely and build on the literature regarding community health and care, as well as alternative methods to improve mental health and associated services. Uh, my paper is sort of the oddball, but um, I'm going to present evidence on a different way of improving mental health. Um, and this uh, very different way will be by cash transfers. So just sort of pulling everything together, the main takeaway and what we should think about here, I think, is that there are lots of ways that mental health can be improved, but the specific modality, context, and design are really important. That's sort of the case in most things, but I think that's what we should be thinking about here. We can contemplate and discuss. Uh, so just a few house rules. Uh, presentations will be eight minutes. Discussants will have one and a half minutes maximum, and the rest will be a discussion at the end. So please hold your questions until then. Um, you can use the raise hand function or type a message into the chat box and I will call on you. Um, I'll just uh, introduce our presenters. Um, Mallory Avery is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pittsburgh. Luis Fontes is a PhD candidate of economics in Sao Paulo School of Economics. Angelica Serrano is a PhD candidate in economics at the Universidad Bremen. And I'm a research fellow at IFPRI in Washington, DC. I also want to really thank our discussant, Kate Orkin, who is a research fellow in the Behavioral Economics Group at the Center for the Study of African Economies, which is part of the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Um, after the session, uh, if you go to the session's uh, website page, you'll see a button at the top that says uh, provide feedback. And so we encourage you to please do so. Um, we encourage also the use of cameras so that we can see you, especially when you're speaking. Um, and uh, do please make sure though that you're muted unless I call on you. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mallory. Mallory, you have eight minutes. All right, so let me just put the bar up here so that I can actually see what I'm doing. Um, hi, my name is Mallory Avery and I'm gonna be presenting a joint work with Jessica Lavoie, who is an assistant professor at Bowdoin College. And the title that this, went in, this was submitted under is the mortality effects of community mental health centers. Uh, as you'll see at the end, we're kind of changing up the title. We've got kind of a, a shift of focus, you might say, that we're uh, kind of pitching here. I'm going to tell you right now, my cats have like lost their minds right now. So if you hear things, it's because of that. And there's really nothing I could do. Uh, okay. Oops. So I probably don't need to motivate that mental illness is a big problem, not only in the United States, but worldwide. It has substantial individual and societal impacts. Um, so being able to treat mental illness uh, is a very important way for us to uh, kind of reclaim some of that lost human capital, as well as just make patients' lives uh, much better. So the World Health Organization in 2001 advocated for community care as the suggested form of treating mental illness. However, until the start of this paper, there really wasn't any uh, quantitative uh, look, um, research looking at is community care an effective way of treating mental illness, especially in contrast to something like institutional care, which is the state of care that a lot of the world is in right now. Institutional care, of course, being taking care of the mentally ill patient of mentally ill patients in an institution um, where they have limited freedoms, but they have constant supervision. Um, however, the United States transition to community care with the passage of the Community Mental Health Act in 1963. So that's the good news. We do have a case study. The bad news is the program went down in history as a total failure, a total flop. However, that the the history of that program is conflated with this, uh, what it was supposed to be replacing, which is the deinstitutionalization of the mental hospitals. 
So no quantitative analysis so far has been done to isolate the effects of community care via community mental health centers from the rest of the policy environment. And the other thing that we're kind of shifting towards more with the focus is that while the current literature on this does not really talk about the impacts uh, that who they're specifically looking at, whose outcomes they're specifically considering, the understanding is that they're primarily looking at the outcomes of the majority groups of white groups. Uh, so we're gonna also think about how race matters here and how maybe who they were looking at, uh, it didn't help them, but there are other groups who benefited a lot. Hint, that's what we find. So just a little of institutional background, the plan for creating community mental health centers, uh, they had to provide inpatient, outpatient care, partial hospitalization, emergency services, and these education consultation services that primarily focus on uh, education in the school context. They had to provide low to no cost treatment for the economically disadvantaged. And for states to get this funding, they had to analyze needs across their state and then make a plan for the order in which areas would receive uh, the community mental health centers before they could receive funding from the federal government. In practice, just over half of the population was covered by 1980. The centers were not uh, designed to serve the severely mentally ill that were being deinstitutionalized. The rollout of the programs didn't follow state plans and they were defunded in 1981. So what we're gonna look at here is what were the effects of community mental health centers on mental health related mortality? We're gonna focus on suicides, homicides and death related to alcohol. Um, this could be anything from you know uh, alcohol overdose, right? To uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And then we're going to analyze this using the rollout of community mental health centers from 1971 to 1981 using a two-way fixed effects design and an event study. We address the Goodman-Bacon two-way fixed effects issue. Thank you, Noreen. Um, and we also do robustness checks. And we're able to do this, the way our identification works is that we're able to show both from historical narratives around this time and empirically that the rollout and the timing and everything about this was just chaotic and random. So for example, in the uh, table below, what you can see is uh, given the state's plans, the plans from the states we were able to find, we can look at where a county was ranked in that plan and compare that to, did they ever get a community mental health center? And what was the order of the rollout? And you can see that it, it just really doesn't correlate at all in any sort of meaningful way. So this is just to give you an idea of what the rollout looks like over space and time. So lighter colors are earlier, darker colors are later. And you can see we have a lot of spatial and time variants. So looking at our results, the first thing to look at here is that when you look at the total population, the, direct, the direction is correct, right? Things are improving, but they're not large. They're not statistically significant. When you look at the white population, it's even smaller. It's basically nothing. However, when you look at the non-white population, you can see substantial and statistically significant decreases in mortality from suicide and homicide for uh, non-white people living in a county that got a community mental health center. Then if we split it out by gender, because gender is going to have a very strong component of mental uh, illness and the seeking of mental health treatment, uh, which I could explain more why that is later, uh, we see that for panel C and D, again, doesn't matter if you split it out by gender, white people were not really being benefited by these. However, non-white people were being benefited. Uh, when you split it out, the suicides are still there, but they're uh, no longer statistically significant. Homicide reduces for both non-white men, non-white women. And we also see a decrease in alcohol-related deaths for non-white women. And then just looking at splitting this out by uh, the age groups, that's another factor that's going to impact uh, mental health and mental health, uh, seeking out mental health treatment. We see that homicides are pretty much reduced in the entire uh, group. Um, and suicides are actually significantly reduced for the youngest uh, population, which for us is gonna be 15 to 24 years old. So basically a quick summary, you know, there's a lot more stuff in the paper, but eight minutes, a quick summary is that we find no effects on the white population, who is probably uh, who these authors at this time were focusing on. 
However, um, we have, thank you, Noreen, uh, reduced mortality in the non-white population. That, that's pretty substantial. And if we think about why that's possible, we can turn to these documents produced by the National Institute of Mental Health, these statistical notes they compiled. The two, three big things were that the ratio of non-white to white population was much larger than the ratio of non-whites to whites in the population, or uh, non-white to white patients was larger than the ratio of non-whites to whites in the population. Uh, number two and number three there pretty much summarize that we think that uh, non-white people had less alternative access to mental health treatment without those community mental health centers. They didn't have other mental health resources around. We also find that non-white uh, population was less likely to have health insurance at this time. So we're really shifting the focus of this paper to talking about this narrative of shifting focus to the non-white population and how our definition of failure changes when you change the population that you're looking at. So we're kind of interested in thinking, is this convincing? Is this interesting? And then our new title, if you look at the, the paper we have, well, not online yet, it's the new title is going to be the effect of failed community mental health centers on non-white mortality, failed in quotation marks. So we're just interested in seeing how people uh, think about the fact and anything else anyone has to say. So thank you. I think I was just 30 seconds over time. Noreen, you're muted. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mallory. That was uh, very much almost on time. <laughs> so uh, I have one and a half minutes. Um, so I will time myself. Uh, this is a really nice paper. It's obviously well thought out. And you guys have done a lot of work, robustness checks, things like that. Um, in terms of the framing, um, I think that, so there's, there's two aspects of this, right? One is that Historically, this has been viewed as a disaster. And when you look at it, that's not the case. Um, the, the particular words of this has been viewed as a disaster, but um, it's actually not. Um, it, I would put it slightly differently, which is that um, the, the last paragraph in your paper, I think is the best framing and the, the best way to kind of write about it, which is, you know, community care is most likely to be effective in environments that are low in alternative mental health services, lower rates of health insurance. Um, and the, the sort of the crux of it here is like, they may be effective at helping not only the mental ill, but also their communities. Um, but the sort of broader implications is that it's important to disaggregate the data and before dismissing a program, because as you said, it then does get defunded. Um, but this was helping the people who needed it most. Um, and uh, the other question I had was um, like, do you have any sense of whether the rankings were any good? It would be interesting to show whether the rank correlated with need um, in addition to whether the rank uh, did not correlate with uh, the actual uh, receiving a CMHC. Uh, so I think what we'll do is go on with presentations and then have you guys come with your answer to the discussion first and then everyone's discussion. Okay. Um, great. So uh, Louise, on to you. Okay, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, so I am Luis Felipe uh, and I am presenting this paper called uh, The Effects of a Large-Scale Mental Health Reform, Evidence from Brazil, co-authored by Matheus Dias, a PhD student from Princeton. So I think it, it is already clear for everyone how important it is to study mental health and in particular when studying how to provide mental health care optimally which is one of the goals of our section. I think an important question of general interest is the effects of uh, the institutionalization. The institutionalization has been taking place in, uh, in many countries, especially high income ones for over 50 years. But international experience suggests that this process is not something simple to be done. And it may not only fail to improve the delivery of mental health care, but also generate undesirable consequences. 
Despite the controversies, there are some specialists who believe that at-risk patients may get worse and put themselves and others in dangers if not treated in a more stricter setting. Empirically, I think this is still an open question, so this paper tries to fill this gap by studying a large-scale uh, mental health reform. Yeah. Our context is the Brazilian psychiatry reform, which reorganized the public mental health care system by building a network of community-based services centered on the psychosocial care centers called COPS. Um, after that, the first point of contact between patients and the public system became COPS and no longer hospitals. And overall, these centers focus on the treatment of moderate and severe disorders. And for that, they deliver a range of outpatient services provided by a multidisciplinary team. And among services, we have medical consultations, individual therapy, group therapy, among others. Some special centers also deliver substance abuse treatment and different from the centers studied by Mallory, most CAPs don't provide intensive care like emergency services. Actually, just 3% of the Brazilian municipalities built centers are delivering this kind of service. And also different from, from her setting, the government here didn't define priority areas. Municipalities must analyze need and then send a plan to the federal government, which then provides funding. Uh, our empirical strategy is similar, so we exploit the sequential process of COPS implementation across the Brazilian cities, which actually followed a staggered design. Uh, we are going to use the DID estimators by the Shedmat Center Fall, and we are going to, to consider three different specifications. In one of them, we include uh, state by year fixed effects, which may be uh, important in the Brazilian context, since a lot of policies are defined at the state level and we further control for a few social, economic, and demographic indicators. We adopt a few strategies to provide evidence in favor of our studies' internal validity. We first show that there is no correlation between implementing a CAPS and past trends in mental health, income, and crime indicators, and we also estimate placebo DAD estimators. So uh, we investigate four sets of outcomes. We start assessing if the reform achieved its goal, so we evaluate indicators of outpatient mental health care production, then we evaluate whether these affected hospital admissions and mental health related deaths. And finally, we, we investigate crimes, mostly homicides. I won't have time to cover all the results, so we will try to present just the main results within each dimension. So I start with the CAPS effects on the production of mental health uh, ambulatory services delivered by mental health professionals. Uh, oh, and during this presentation, I'm using the term ambulatory and outpatient services interchangeably. So I'm basically referring to visits in which care is provided on an outpatient basis like diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation services. So for those procedures delivered by psychiatrists, we see that uh, after CAPS started working, uh, there was a significant increase in the ambulatory production by almost 140 procedures per 10,000 people, or 140% uh, compared to the baseline rate. Okay, uh, no worries. thank you. Uh, we find a similar pattern for procedures delivered by therapists, which increases by 80%, and psychologists, which increases by 70%. In the paper, we provide additional results that together with these support the conclusion that the reform is associated with a significant expansion of outpatient mental health care production. We then analyze whether this increase was followed by a reduction of inpatient admittance. The most remarkable effect we find here is an immediate and persistent uh, decrease in long-stay hospitalizations by 0.7 admissions by 10,000 people or 11% relative to the baseline. And we kind of replicated this effect when uh, looking only at schizophrenia, which is, according to our data, precisely the profile of CAPS patients. So in general, the reform is associated with a decrease in hospital admissions for more severe cases of mental illness, individuals with schizophrenia who otherwise would have been hospitalized for an extended period. Uh, regarding deaths of despair, uh, the estimates indicate uh, no effect, even in heterogeneous analysis. Uh, but I think it's also worth mentioning that the results we obtain when exploiting variability coming only from those special centers working on substance abuse treatment. In this case, we do find effects on deaths by alcoholic liver disease, which decreases by 10%. And this reduction is consistent with the fact that the introduction of these centers is followed by a remarkably increase in the number of 
ambulatory procedures for substance abuse disorders, a result we didn't find when studying the most common centers. Well, I hope these results gave a broad picture uh, of the policy's effects on health indicators. Then I would like to move on to the effects on homicides, which I present in this graph. As you can see, the creation of cops is associated with a modest but persistent increase in the homicide rate. That goes up to 0.2 deaths for every 10,000 inhabitants. Uh, and the average effect over the event times is 0.12 or 6% relative to the baseline. We believe the most convincing explanation for this result is some kind of incapacitation channel. So it is driven by uh, the reduction of long stay admissions among severe mentally ill individuals. And if it, this is the only channel operating here, then the ratio between the CAPS effect on homicides and the CAPS effect on hospital admissions would predict that 16% of the de-hospitalized patients uh, get involved in these, in these violent deaths. Uh, data from papers following individuals after a psychiatric discharge suggests that around 40% get involved in a violent crime, either as victims or perpetrators. But given that we are evaluating only homicides and not crimes more generally, our reduced form prediction would be a bit high, but we still think it could be reasonable given this number. Uh, we further investigate whether our results could reflect differential trends in observable determinants of crime more generally. And we then got data from Sao Paulo, the only state in Brazil for which we had crime data over the entire period. And we analyzed several outcomes and for all of them, the estimates are very close to zero or even negative. We also try a bunch of robustness checks to investigate other potential internal validity problems. So, and basically after including state-specific trends, the results remain remarkably stable no matter how we try to further adjust for specific trends. And our data is also not consistent with displacement effects. So uh, just, just to conclude, let me just say that, just to sum up, the reform achieved its goal. So. Um, we, found, we found a massive increase in outpatient mental health care production, a decrease in hospital admissions, especially among the severe mentally ill. Uh, a significant result we learned from this context is that community-based substance abuse treatment can be an important tool to, in, in reducing alcohol-related deaths. But our results on homicides highlight important trade-offs to be considered when choosing the optimal way of delivering mental health care. Of course, of course, it, it is hard to pin down exactly, exactly what's going on without identifying data, but uh, so I would like to know whether you have other mechanisms in mind uh, or whether you would, you, you would frame the paper differently. And just one thing I want to, to, to let clear uh, regarding our, our design is that Brazil's reform occurred late and we still need much more investment. So very few municipalities have centers that with the infrastructure and the capacity to handle more delicate cases. And the literature emphasizes that more structured care is essential to reduce the risk of crimes committed by uh, severe mental uh, ill patients in the community. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Luis. Um... I, didn't so I didn't see your red card, Noreen, so sorry about that. No, no, that, that, that's fine. Um, I will go shorter on my discussion then. Um, so your main, the main area of feedback you wanted us to think about was this effect on homicides. Um, and your, uh, you know, your, your theory of incapacitation makes total sense. If people are not in the population, they can't commit homicide. Um, and so, you know, the, one of the things is that, you know, people who really needed hospitalization maybe didn't get it, right? So hospitalizations went down, other types of treatments went up, but maybe people who really should have been hospitalized were not. I'm not sure you can get data on that or whether you can tease that out, but it is something that you could think about. Um, the other thing that came to mind was that um, you know, you, the, the homicides in your data are both uh, as a perpetrator and as a victim. I'd be curious to see that disaggregation. Um, so there, there's, um, yeah, I, ju I just think that that could provide insight into mechanisms um, 
as well as kind of what happened to other institutions? Did they close down? They got less funding? Um, so just kind of thinking about the, the overall context as well. I didn't time that, but that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, so Angelica, we'll turn it over to you. Angelica, you're muted. Yeah, now. Uh, okay. Now, can you hear me? Okay. So our paper um, is about the effect of mental health courts on crime. Um, it's a joint paper with Elliot Ash, an assistant professor at ITH Theory, where I was before, but I'm now in Bremen, um, in Germany. Um, our research question is, do a specialized mental health courts reduce crime? Um, introducing in 1990, mental health courts divert individuals with mental illness from prisons into community-based treatment. They appear um, in 1990, and their prevalence have increased quite, quick, quite quickly in the United States since then. Um, uh, first of all, I want to just highlight the difference between the, a traditional court and a mental health court. Um, in contrast to traditional courts, mental health courts have therapeutic, th therape therapeutic goals such as increasing adherence to treatment and decreasing involvement in the criminal justice system. And uh, mental health courts also include a separate docket for defendants with mental disorders. And in contrast to traditional courts, mental health courts include a designated judge, designated prosecution, and defense counsel. Um, and an important feature of mental health courts um, which is for me the most important is its non-adversarial -adver team approach involving cooperation and, jo and joint decision making between criminal justice and health professionals, such as fro forensic psychiatrists. Um, as we all know, uh, mental illness is really a problem. Um, in the United States, almost 20% almost of the population have a mental illness in a given year, accounting for um, 43 million adults. And um, this rate is substantially higher in the criminal justice population where 64% of convicted individuals of local jails, jails have mental health um, problems. Um, when we look at the epidemiology of mental illness, um, it indicates a correlation between mental illness, health conditions, and a set of crime-related outcomes. Um, during the last decade, we have seen a new research um, emerging on the effect of mental health treatment on crime, uh, on crime outcomes. And in general, economists have found, have found that mental health treatment can help to reduce crime. But in contrast to this, um, there has been little research in the field of economics on the link between mental health courts and crime, despite the rapid increase of um, mental health courts in the United States. So with our paper, we aim to close this gap by studying the causal link between mental health courts and uh, crime outcomes. Um, one of our innovation is that we construct our own um, data set on um, mental health courts. Uh, we scrape the data uh, of the mental health courts established um, in the United States across counties from 1995 to 2016. So what are the mechanisms? Um, we'll try to convince you that um, mental health courts will uh, uh, help to reduce crime because they facilitate the provision of mental health treatment. So um, imprisonment is replaced or complemented with mental health uh, treatment, um, which evidence has suggested that it can reduce criminal behavior. This in turn will help to break recidivism cycles um, that are prevalent among individuals with mental illness. Uh, one difference, um, so unlike mo uh, common mental health treatment, mental health courts, are um, targeted already to those individuals where we have observed that uh, mental illness has resulted in criminal behavior. Um, as I mentioned, um, we observe uh, um, an increased prevalence of mental health uh, course in the United States over time. 
at um, in the first decade of um, 2000, we had 207, and um, up to 2016, we, we had 339. This took place, especially uh, after the institutionalization. Um, so our data on crimes comes uh, from the uniform crime reports. And we use county level detail arrest and offense data, and we create aggregate measures of violent crime, property crime, and um, the sum of both of them, which is um, we call the total crime. And as I mentioned before, uh, our data on mental health course come from the um, scraped data of uh, the web page of the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Transformation. And um, in total, we, we analyzed 60, 65,000 um, 600 county year pairs and um, 339 mental health calls. Um, to um, estimate the effect of mental health calls on crime, we use a two way fixed effects regression model. Um, the effect of mental health calls is identified based on the within county variation of crime rates among counties that established mental health calls during this period, so 1995 to 2016. And we include county fixed effects and state by year fixed effects. Uh, our specification, in our specification, we include also a population weights and uh, we use OLS with errors cluster at the county level. So um, here uh, we see the summary statistics of the main outcome variables. Uh, our dependent variables are always in um, crime rates per 10,000 residents. And um, here we see the values of the mean pooled over the 1995 to 2016 period. Sorry, I have a mistake here <laughs> in the table title. And um, we see that the total crime rates per 10,000 residents is um, 7.5 with a rate of 18.6 violent crimes and 51.8 property crimes. And this is our main results. Um, we look at the effect of mental health calls on violent crime, property crime, and total crime. We find that um, overall, uh, the effect of a mental health court on crime rates is negative and significant. And um, yeah, <laughs> that's the first uh, main results. Um, our, um, yeah. So uh, here I want to, to kind of disaggregate a bit um, for which crimes are mental health courts relevant and for which we find that they are not that relevant and this is where we want to, to work further. So we see that um, looking at the effect across individual type of crimes, um, the effect is not significant for rape and arson, which is a little surprising for me because uh, in the literature we, we observe or we read a lot that um, mental illness is um, highly correlated with arson crimes. And, um, but it is significant for murder crimes. And um, here I put all together, so all the type of crimes that we analyze, um, and we see that uh, the impact of the establishment of a mental health court is significant on crimes like aggravated assault, larceny, and motor vehicle death, deaths. Mm, our identification uh, assumption is parallel trends. Um, and here, um, this figure in the slide show the dynamic event study of introducing a mental health court on crime per capita. And we see that consistent with parallel trends that there are no effects in the year before of the introduction of a court. Looking at the years after, we see evidence that the introduction of a mental health court reduces crime. The effect is seen two, three years after the introduction of a court, which persists suggesting that it takes some time for the court to reduce recidivism. Okay, okay thank you, Nore. Okay. We are done. We are. Oh, right. Okay. I know. Great. So it's finished. Okay. Do All I... right. Okay. So I... I don't know. Ah, yes. I remember these slides. Okay. So, so basically lots of robustness checks and they all check out. I will assure people because I went through the presentation. <laughs> and yeah, and that's the summary of the results. And... Um, yeah, the, we still have uh, some next steps. So there's a, still a lot of work. This is very, very preliminary research, but um, yeah, that's all. And thank you for hearing me. Great, thanks so much, Angelica. That was a great presentation. So Mallory, I'll turn it over to you for your comments. 
Awesome. So um, this is really cool to read about or watch about, I guess. I guess I watched the longer presentation. Um, so a couple of just sort of um, nitty gritty things. Um, first off, if you are compiling a new data set, that should be like super on your list of contributions. That should be the first thing you talk about in your data section. Like if you're compiling a new data set, like advertise it, like, like be out there with it. Um, and th so that's something I had to be told because we compiled a new data set for ours and like own it. Um, so with the two way fixed effects, uh, just so you know, you got to deal with a whole bunch of the Goodman Bacon issues with two way fixed effects, Callaway Santana modifications. One of the ways that you can kind of get around that is just focus on event studies um, and your event study graphs look really good. So like I would just sort of try and uh, focus on that if you can. Um, you you want to talk about robustness and whatever, um, but I think one of the things you I would really want to see right now is a discussion of why certain locations, I guess this is somewhat location based, why certain places get mental health courts, right? Are, what are the demographics, the crime rates, uh, basically what predicts where a court goes? And the best thing would be able to say like, we can't predict it given this stuff, but if you, you gotta be able to, to show that or to figure out how you're gonna deal with it. And then um, would rape, murder, arson, would those kind of crimes go to a mental health court? Um, and I'm getting my red thing, so I'll stop until later. I have one more thing. But I'll wait until later. Thank you. And we will, we do plan to have a lively discussion and uh, uh, lots of questions at the end, and you can also talk with each other afterwards. Um, all right, so that's me then. Oops. What have I done to myself? I think Angelica needs to stop sharing her yes, screen. That's right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try and keep my own time um, and I will do my best there. Uh, but if someone notices, just wave like a, like a crazy person. Okay. Um, can I move this? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to be talking about cash transfers, mental health, and investments. And this is going to be in the context of Molly. And this is joint work with Melissa Hedrobo and Shalini Roy, who are also at ICFRI. Don't think I need to convince anyone that mental illness is a huge portion of the global burden of disease and that poverty and health uh, and mental health are inextricably linked. So they reinforce one another. Poverty can lead to uh, mental ill health and other psychological disorders. And then those can then uh, lead to difficulties in moving out of poverty. So I wanna think about this in sort of a three-part framework. And the first part is the link between poverty and mental health. Uh, so poor people tend to worry more about money and food. They deal with a lot of shocks and uncertainty. And this can uh, often lead to depression and anxiety. The second part is the link between mental health and decision making. Um, so when people are very anxious and worried, they tend to make less optimal, less optimistic and less forward looking decisions. And that ties into the final part, which is the link between decision making and then future outcomes. So because of worse decision making, future earning potential is lower. And this often happens through lower investments in physical and human capital. And then people then tend to remain in poverty. So thinking more about part two, um, poor cognitive, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, anxiety will lead to poor cognitive function, reduced patience, low self-esteem and higher risk aversion. And these have been shown, um, the, these links have been shown extensively in the literature. And uh, so then the, the third part, poor cognitive function can result in less effective and less efficient decisions. 
reduced patience will lead to less forward thinking and uh, fewer forward thinking investments. Low self-esteem can lead to second guessing decisions or just avoiding them completely. And risk aversion we know um, can result in investing in the future at a lower rate, right? So what I'm gonna do is look at Mali's national cash transfer program and how it affects these kinds of outcomes. Mali is one of the poorest countries in the world. And uh, this cash transfer program came in and uh, paid transfers um, or every quarter. And these transfers amounted to about 13% of uh, household income, which is a, a pretty decent chunk. And these transfers were provided alongside training sessions on nutrition, uh, financial literacy, and other topics. In our sample, we've got uh, about 2,500 households, and we had two rounds of surveying, and we created a panel of primary household decision makers. So these are the people who make most of the decisions on spending um, and, and other big choices in the household, investment, schooling, um, all of that. The decision maker was identified during the second round in the household questionnaire, but then the decision maker, him or herself, was then administered a separate questionnaire and that's where most of our outcomes are gonna come from. Very standard empirical strategy for an RCT, treatment dummy, baseline value when available, stratifixed effects, standard errors clustered at the level of randomization. And I will assure you that the sample is balanced and there's no selective attrition. So just to show you our, our framework graphically, um, just to, to, to just sort of think through uh, what our hypotheses are, right? So cash transfer will just mechanically increase income. And this increased income should lead to fewer worries about money and food, and then less sort of stress in general. This lower uh, stress should lead to improved cognition, improved self-esteem, and more patience. And then these factors should lead to higher levels of asset accumulation, savings, and investments. And again, this could be physical or human capital. And this should then lead to future outcomes being higher. We also want to recognize, though, that cash transfers will also directly affect savings, investments, and assets, right? So we're not saying that this is a causal chain, but just recognizing that this is a potential channel. Okay. So jumping into the results, we asked people whether they were worried or very worried about some financial domains and about having enough food. And it looks like those who received cash transferred worried less in these dimensions. We used um, uh, Cohen's perceived stress scale as our measure of anxiety slash stress. And I'm, uh, I'm realizing that the word anxiety, which is sort of <laughs> more general and picks up something a bit different. It, um, so I, I will use the word stress from now on because that's an, an important point. Thank you, Kate, for, I saw your slides. Um, so just so people are clear on what we're talking about. Um, so stress, uh, more general stress seems to have been reduced in the treatment group. Um, we measured cognition using digit span forward or backward and didn't really see any changes in cognition. Um, when we administered a stress, uh, sorry, a self-esteem scale, we found that uh, the treatment group had much higher levels of self-esteem. And there is some evidence, so we don't want to hang our hats on this, that uh, um, inpatience was reduced, so people became more patient. When we look at assets, we look at durables like fridges, chairs, and productive assets that would lead to further income. Uh, so these are having cows to sell milk or uh, machinery to make your farm more efficient. And the treatment group had higher levels of assets in all of these categories. The treatment group was also likely to have any savings 
the amount of savings is a bit tricky. Um, it, there's a negative coefficient, but there's a lot of noise in these data. So, you know, it's, it's possible that the amount of savings did decrease, um, but, uh, you know, so people maybe were, were saving at a higher rate, but saving less. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to think about that, but please share thoughts. And it doesn't seem to be the case that uh, credit increased. Um, investments were made in lots of productive assets, small animals, livestock, non-agricultural equipment. These are things that increase future in, uh, income. Um, in terms of human capital, these are three different measures of dietary quality and they all improve for the treatment group. And there's also some evidence, but it's not exactly consistent that people were also making investments in education. So people are indeed investing in the future. So what we learn is that cash transfers can play a role in improving mental health um, and physical and human capital investments. Um, some literature has shown that psychotherapy and medication treatments can be expensive and might not be effective in short time scales and maybe don't persist. Um, there is a paper that recently showed that the combination of cash transfers and psychotherapy did not have effects over and above just cash transfers. But I think one of the main things here is that if we don't take uh, into account the positive effects of cash transfers and other programs into mental health outcomes that then would feed back into poverty, um, we can really underestimate the cost effectiveness of uh, programs. I will stop there. And I will turn it over to you, Kate. Um, Great, I think you've got it, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, Okay, great. Cool. So, um, uh, there we go. Um, so, oh, sorry, my computer's. There we go. Um, so uh, I think first to say the, the good stuff, I think this is a really well-run kind of clean experiment. Um, you know, you've got a good sample size, you're well-powered to look at the things you're, you're looking at. And I think, um, you know, it's a very unique set of outcomes. There's, it's one of only a few uh, studies in the world that will have measured these things. So I think that's, that's really um, exciting. Um, I think I had comments sort of uh, mainly about the, the literature. I think I'd given some smaller ones on the results, um, but I think you can probably go through uh, most of those. In I think the biggest two things I would say, the one is uh, in thinking about the, the rest of the cash transfer literature. I think it would be important to take a step back and think about what your study contributes relative to others. Um, so, you know, that some of this territory has already been captured by the House of Bishop Bureau uh, 2016, where they collect a lot of these measures. Um, they're looking at lump sum and smaller transfers. I'm not sure in their study which is driving effects. Um, but I think, you know, one angle maybe that you look at, if they don't find effects of the smaller transfers, you know, maybe you are looking at, at uh, that yeah. instead. I mean, the other might be thinking about, do you want to try and um, do some mediation analysis or something like that, which they don't do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think very consciously uh, forcing yourself to look at unpleasantly at the one other paper in the literature that does something quite similar and saying, what do you build on it? Um, and thinking about the next steps of analysis relative to that. I think that would probably be the next thing I would I would do, because um, I think that will really determine kind of where it, it uh, places. Um, and then the one other literature, which is not so much related to mental health, um, is the recent work on, um, you know, when workers, uh, the, the financial stresses and productivity uh, literature. So they sort of uh, look at giving people transfers and how that affects their productivity. But they look at a lot of the same outcomes you're looking at, um, but, you know, not mental health, but they look at uh, cognition and a lot of the other outcomes. Um, right. So I think as well as thinking about cash transfers and mental health, I would have a little bit more of a look at the kind of papers that look at poverty and cognition, sort of some of your secondary outcomes. 
Um, but I think, yeah, making that that contribution a little bit a little bit clearer. Um, and I think that that might let you think about what um, next steps you want to do. And then okay. the other thing I think. Sorry. In, I'm so oh. sorry. Okay. Sorry. You and I Can I say this the first point in the question? Sorry. I'll take the first. If I, I'll take the first question while I'm, if that's. Because you're gonna are you gonna go to questions now? Yes, but I'm gonna okay. ask the audience to open okay. up questions. Sorry, Kate always has the best advice, but I really, she really does. Um, but I, I do want to ask people online uh, to um, put your questions in the chat box. We do have a couple, but I'd, I'd really like to open it up to the audience to make sure we have some time for discussion. Um, I'm happy to go a little bit over time if you guys are happy to. Um, but uh, anyone in the audience who is not a presenter or discussant, uh, if you want, just just type your name and you don't have to type your question. I'll unmute you, but I, I really want to give uh, people a chance. So uh, people who are not presenters or discussants, type your name in the chat box and I will call on you. Uh, John Fountain looks like he has a question. Oh, great. Go ahead, John. Um, yeah, uh, it, was, it was for Louise. I was just wondering if, um, if there was any way to tell if the, the rising homicide rates related to mental health patients as victims of crime rather than perpetrators. And I'm sorry if that was your, your question. Uh, anyway. Louise, do you want to take that question? And you can also take the opportunity to respond to any questions. Uh, uh, other points that people have raised. Yeah, I think this question is similar to the Noreen's point as well. Um, actually, we have only access to the victims, gender and age. We do not have data on perpetrators. Uh, what we can show that is the effects on homicides are mainly driven by the deaths of middle-aged men. And the drop in hospitalizations is more balanced across gender and age beings, but we still see a significant effect in the admissions, in the hospital admissions of middle-aged men. So I'm not sure whether this heterogeneity would, would help much because it can be consistent with both. Thank you. This is going to merit more thinking and discussion. Yeah. I may uh, also answer your previous point and also Katie's point yeah. as well. Okay, so we also talked about the closure of other institutions. Uh, uh, we show in the paper that the police did not close psychiatric beds and it didn't reduce the supply of psychiatrists working in hospitals. Uh, then answering Kate as well, we have two other explanations for the hospitalization effects based on demand-driven effects. So it is already known that Community-based care facilities uh, looks for you know prevention, which may directly reduce the disease burden and enhance the demand for specialized specialized care within a hospital setting. So in this case, we could see hospital admissions as a result, as Kate said. But a related explanation is that community-based care would provide what the literature calls as a filter effect along the pathway to inpatient care. So in a counterfactual situation, individual would be more likely to look for a hospital first because they wouldn't find treatment in the community. And in those situations, they would receive hospital care and in several cases be hospitalized. Now they are more likely to be treated in the community first. So I think we can't okay. really differentiate both. Okay. Panka, you had a question. Yeah, uh, I had one question to Mallory and one to Angelica. Uh, so Mallory, um, what a fascinating paper. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, I love your emphasis on looking at subgroups um, and especially marginalized subgroups. I think this is something that we should be doing more of. Uh, I wanted to respond to your question at the end with the new title and the framing. I um, personally potentially would angle it more towards a title that implies hidden success rather than failure, because I think if your title says failure, it's hard to know, even if it's on qu in quotes, I mean, it's just, I'm gonna assume that I'm reading a no result paper or like that the point is that this failed. So I think I would try to like emphasize the positivity in it um, and 
as you highlighted as well, I would certainly push the angle that you are showing results for a subgroup um, that has been missed. Awesome, thanks. That's a good point to, to shift it away from, um, make it more positive, yeah. And then- Especially because you show positive like effects, right? Right, exactly, so you show that things are you good. You show positive yeah. effects, have a, have a title, yeah. Yeah, um, and then just to quickly say from um, what, one of the things that Noreen said in her comment about the, um, the ranks. So what we can say is that the ranking, we can say that the states made the rankings on their own, decided on their own what would be incorporated. Um, the ranks, poverty, other resources that were available in those areas, and alcoholism seem to be the big three common factors that are, are talked about in these state plans as determining the ranking. But something we haven't done that I think would be a really good idea is to look at how the rankings uh, correlate to some of these measures that we're also able yeah. to show, like don't relate to, uh, to yeah. uh, where they end up. So that'd be yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Kate, uh, sorry, I, I had to cut you off before, but do you want to uh, ask your question? Or was it already addressed? Um, no, I think I think uh, uh, Louise already addressed it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, John, did you have another question? No, I didn't. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyway, I think I had one more. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I had one more to Angelica, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So, Angelica, what what an interesting study. I really appreciate your exploration of mental health courts. Uh, this is not something that has been discussed, I think, empirically enough, and uh, it's fascinating. I think your main result is that there is a reduction of 7% um, across all crimes, right? And so I thought that is a very big number, right? Like, kind of any policy that would reduce crimes by 7% would be lauded as the solution. Uh, so I would love to know more about how many people on average go through mental health court and how many cases are heard and how many judges there are. Like, I would need to see kind of the robustness of the courts in order for that seven percent to match. That would be super helpful. Yeah, that would be a nice addition. Um... Anyone else? Thanks. Your name Thanks, Frank. I will address that. I think. Um, thank you. Actually, why don't we give the presenters a sec to uh, answer questions that discusses um, shared. I already answered mine, so. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, everyone feels comfortable. Uh, anyone else in the session have uh, comments, questions? Aisha, go ahead. Um, hi, my question is for Mallory. Um, really great presentation, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, do you guys have any data on other types of deaths like overdose or drug related deaths um, that you could consider looking at as an outcome? And this also, is like oh, every, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Also, I noticed um, Kate um, commented that um, deaths might be a hard outcome to move. And could we look at something that like other crimes and uh, kind of putting together um, what I saw from the other presentations? Um, like property crime or so on. Thanks. So everybody asked about overdoses and we went into this thinking we're going to see something on overdoses. It turns out that in this time frame, so this is all coming from the mortality files and it's basically what uh, cause of death was put on someone's um, death certificate. And if the, it just wasn't as common for whatever reason for coroners to put deaths from drug overdoses on death certificates. So the rates that we get are like incredible, like without even talking about treatments or whatever, the rates of overdose deaths are like almost nothing, <clears throat> which just doesn't make 
it just doesn't resonate in our world. So we have to like, we have footnotes in our paper and everything like multiple places saying like, we tried overdose deaths, but there's something about the way that these things were coded that it just does not happen. So the other thing we looked at that was, uh, you didn't bring up, but that I thought that is very connected is we also try to get at like deaths from like homelessness basically. So things like hunger, exposure, whatever. And again, we we didn't find anything, but the rates were just so low, they really couldn't be pushed down. Um, with regards to your question about other outcomes, because of the time frame that we're looking at, there really aren't any data sets for things like crimes or things like mental health uh, diagnosis rates or whatever. So unfortunately, we can't look at all those other things. In a follow-up paper, we're planning to look at some economic outcomes. So kind of angling more at the idea that not only are we treating patients with the community centers, uh, community mental health centers, but we're also treating communities, right? So if you have a, a mental, severely mentally ill person living at home, not only can that person not work if they're not getting any sort of treatment, but then someone has to take care of them, right? They have to have a caregiver. That person can't work outside the home. So it's more, um, that idea is more about like, we're not just treating an individual, we're treating all these people connected. But unfortunately, like no crime rates, uh, no, no hospitalization records, nothing useful like that, that you get with more modern data. <laughs> Uh, so we are a bit over time, uh, so I'll sort of formally close the session, but anyone who would like to stay on, especially, for example, if uh, um, the presenters or discussants want to stay on, um, I'm happy to, and I, I ha in, in, <laughs> in any uh, form, I really encourage um, Mallory, Angelica, and, and Louise to, like, talk at some point because your papers are just so related to one another and i think it would be of course you'll all cite each other right um but uh you know kind of reconciling these different sets of results will be really interesting and um, you know merit some discussion in your papers um and you know we, we could sort of think about you know how do we think about jails versus community mental health centers versus like mental health institutions are they potentially poor substitutes? What is their availability? What are the base rates of mental illness? Just, you know, things like that. Um, so I think that could help to bring some of these things together. And I, I hope you guys will have some, uh, some discussion of that. Congratulations, Angelica, on your first conference presentation. Very, very well done. Very well. Thank you for your yes. feedback yeah. support and <laughs> No, thank you for your help and support and feedback. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining the session. I hope it was enjoyable. Yeah. And thanks so much, Kate, for your feedback and participating and we really appreciate it. And Panka also for organizing this. Yeah. Thank thanks you. for bringing us together. Louise, just quickly before uh, we pop off, um, so, you know, obviously we find very different effects on homicides between our two papers. The reason why I think we don't find it in ours is that deinstitutionalization happened prior to, like, the community mental health centers were the US was just such a catastrophe at this point. Uh, the de deinstitutionalization and the community mental health centers were all sort of the same like push uh, policy wise, but they got, they were really quick about deinstitutionalization and really slow about community mental health centers. So like the thing we have going for us identification wise is that deinstitutionalization happened, right? So any of those increase in um, mental illness that like we, uh, not mental illness and like mental illness related issues like homicides like happened before our time period ever started. I do wonder if that's what's going on with you. And the only reason that kind of concerns me is it suggests maybe that you that there's selection into where these caps are going that you're maybe uh -huh. not taking into account. Right. So like if that is the case that uh, that homicides are increasing where these caps are put after they're put there. That suggests to me that the caps are being put there because 
that's where the mentally ill people are going or are. So like, I just, I wonder if there's a way you can handle that. Like if you can look at, maybe look at the caps controlling for the, the decrease in the hospitalization rate uh -huh. to control for that. So you can kind of take into account maybe, so what you'd really be then comparing is like places with similar, what I would call deinstitutionalization rates, but then with like one has a caps and one doesn't. But you mean uh, controlling for past trends or controlling for the contemporaneous value? Um, I would say it's hard because I don't totally know your. Because your, you know, we try, we try several. Go ahead, something go ahead. like that, like your the contemporary. I would almost it would almost be like the tr the decrease up to that point, maybe. Yeah, we try that. You tried that. One of the things you tried. Yeah, because related to your, to your point, something we try to do is to estimate a Razor model where our outcome is the probability of adopting a, adopting a CAPS. And then we try to include as covariates several past trends, several past trends, and none of them correlates with the adoption of CAPS. Okay. So we think that's related to your point. We yeah, also that, try to that. control for, for the past trends in our main outcomes, including hospitalizations. Didn't change the results much. But I think one major difference between our centers is that your centers provide inpatient care as well. Yes. Yes. The centers I study uh, don't provide this type of care. This type of care. Yeah. But, um, um, how is in Brazil? Because in Colombia, we don't really, we didn't really have a lot of psychiatrists. Um, Per, uh, I don't know, per 10,000 person at the time. So mm -hmm. in Brazil, uh, I was wondering, yeah, per, per population, how many, how many psychiatrists per, per, these caps were covering how much of the population? Yeah. And yeah. How Local governments hired new physicians, new psychiatrists to work at those centers. The supply can... actually, the, the supply was low, but the local governments find a way to, to hire. For, more for professionals. Okay. I think we're being told by the tech support that we have to get off. Uh, so, um, all right. Just one question, uh, Margaret. Oh, yeah, I will get in touch with you. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you so much. So great to see you all and meet you all finally. It's a Ten minute grace period. Apparently. <laughs> grace. Okay, well, thank you so much to thank tech you. support. I, yeah. I really appreciate it. You being here and and kind of just making sure everything has gone smoothly. So. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye bye. Take care, bye -bye. you guys. Good to meet you. Bye bye.